So if we get everybody, well, doesn't look like we have everybody ready yet, but we're going to go ahead and start. Maybe not. <laughs> we're thank you. Uh, it's, uh, thank you for uh, coming this evening. It's the uh, February 3rd uh, the City Council work session, and I understand we're going to start with a, an item not on the agenda. It's uh, Mike Crass and Public Works. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, since we I appreciate your adding this to the agenda, we just thought it would be a good idea since uh, we, we did just finish one winter event uh, and we are about to commence another uh, they're talking about significant uh, snowfall uh, beginning uh, early tomorrow morning so we thought it'd be maybe a good idea for uh, public works director Mike Kras to uh, just sort of review the last event and talk about that a little bit and some of the challenges that it presented for us and then uh, also talk about the uh, the means of attack that we're going to be using for uh, the uh, coming event so I'll go ahead and turn it over to Mike Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank the Mayor for indulging, indulging us. Um, I want to kind of give a little debriefing of the, of the last, last event we had and kind of compare it to a typical, typical snow event. Uh, I, I've handed out some, some pictures. The first picture is what we are dealing with during a typical snow event when we're, when we're applying salt. Um, the plows have been through. There's a small little layer of snow left and we uh, we apply salt to, to melt that off and and keep it keep it from from refreezing. During this this last event, we started we started um, by pre we always our a typical attack of a snowstorm is 24 to 72 hours prior to in a predicted event. We will pre-treat the streets with with brine, and the purpose for that is to give us a little jump start on some melting and an interface between the, the streets and the um, and the snow or ice. So. If you go to the second the second page, there's a picture, kind of a green and blue, um, green and blue diagram there that shows a little bit of what what happens and how how salt um, works in a in a typical snow and uh, a relatively minor ice event. What I what I want to focus on is the kind of kind of the blue diagram, where you see the little where the, and this is what was happening during the ice event. We did apply. Um, salt to the to the streets to the ice after after the event but what was happening is the, the salt it doesn't sit on the surface it there's not enough there to completely melt the ice that's there we just cannot put that down in sufficient quantity to do that so what it was doing was melting melting through the ice and it was starting to form a brine and underneath underneath the ice you could start seeing it as as the snow as it started to melt you could start seeing water and such under under the ice temperatures and we were able to get a lot done when temperatures were up that first night on the major roads um, temperatures tanked and the, the salt quit working and we were just uh, really depending on temperatures to come back up to soften soften the ice to to get to the point where we could catch it with a blade and start peeling it off and we hit a small window um, we bet, I mean, we were in trying to clear as much as we could on Saturday. Sunday afternoon, we hit a very small window in the afternoon when the sun finally came out. And then today, when the same sun came out and the uh, temperatures came up, we made a lot of progress. Um, you know, one of the, we've, we've got some questions, you know, comments from folks, you know, I was able to put salt on my driveway and, and scrape it, scrape it off. There's a couple of differences with the way a, a homeowner does a driveway. And my driveway, I, I used about 30 pounds of salt to get things loosened up on my driveway. That equates to about 10 times what we would put down on a, on a street. Another, another difference was folks were saying, well, I could scrape it up with an ice scraper. Well, you can get under the, yeah, you can get under the ice with an ice scraper. Our plows are vertical. They don't, they don't really get under the ice. We've got to really catch an edge to get it to get it open we also the plows on purpose don't provide a lot of down pressure the reason for that is when there's down pressure on the plows and they get caught that whole that truck then has a mind of its own and we did have a couple of instances where our guys things got caught they took out a mailbox they took out some sod we did unfortunately hit a hit a parked car on on one of the streets and so that's really why those plows they, they float and they aren't designed necessarily to dig to dig all the way in so you know it was a it was a tough event um i think my guys were probably 
as frustrated as anybody else with the lack of progress they were able to make they really really try hard and to get things cleared as, as soon as they as soon as they can so I, I think that's kind of some of the differences and some of the challenges that we encountered during during the event I can happy to answer any questions I can about that and then if not we'll kind of move into our, our plan of attack for uh, this upcoming event questions uh, council member Kellogg Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm wondering if there's any kind of new equipment or equipment that we haven't utilized or don't own here in the city that other cities may be using that could be beneficial for you know events like this. Uh, we have a, Mr. Stevens and I have a, a constituent in our in our ward that uh, he used to move snow in another state and work with these events and he said he's told us that there there are different pieces of equipment now which ones I don't know but I'm just asking if there's equipment that you know that we the council could approve uh, if it was shown to us that it would be beneficial I, I, I guess I'm not ruling out anything uh, but if there's something that we can do to help you help us I'd like to know about it I will I will take that back to my staff because I am not, I am not aware of anything that that could really help us with with an event like this, other than time, time and temperatures. But I will, I will follow up. I will take that back to my staff and, and take and uh, follow up with Mr. Berlin. Other questions, or I, I don't see any other questions. Okay. Thank you. We have what's what's coming is the latest prediction is about anywhere from four to eight to plus inches inches of snow and it's going to be a very challenging event it's it's going to be a long-term snowfall they're talking about snow falling over 18 hours uh, winds are going to pick up we're hearing that there's potentially going to be near blizzard blizzard conditions um, it is you know we are and so that is going to necessitate we are going to end up plowing streets several times you may hear that I a plow wasn't down my street and that's because we've gone through and after we've gone through cars have gone through and there's snowpack you know we you know only we, the only streets that we try and and get clear hundred percent clear pavement on our, our priority one and priority two routes um, we uh, we will plow um, around the clock with full work shift, with full shifts as, as always. Um, it is going to take us longer than usual to clear the streets, and because of that, we're going to we're going to change um, change kind of our, our method of operation for the for this event. We can easily handle up to about a, a four inch four inch snow event with plowing streets curb to curb and following our strictly following our priority priority routes where once it quits snowing we concentrate on the priority one and priority two routes then move into into the neighborhood routes and everybody's favorite the cul-de-sacs and, and dead ends um what we kind of learned learned last we took a look at our after the last year's couple of big snow events we took a took a look at at our program and um looked at what can we what can we do to get get folks moving moving faster we had we had folks in in their houses for for quite a while because the street there was a lot of snow um, what we're going to be so we've kind of divided our our snow uh, attack into two levels for a zero to four inch snowfall and four to six or more uh, so what we're going to be doing with this one is is we will the only road that we are going to initially plow full width is 58 highway we just ha we have to do that there is so much traffic on that road uh, the remaining priority one priority two routes things like Dean Avenue uh, Fox Ridge Drive any of the multi-lane roads we're going to plow them to, to only one lane one lane each direction maybe a little more than one lane each direction so we're not spending a lot of time clearing those roads all the way to um, curb to curb we will um, we will clear intersections we will clear all the all the traffic signals to provide normal normal turn lanes but uh, for example the Fox Ridge coming up from the school that's only gonna be one lane until you get somewhere near CVS and it'll it'll open back it'll open back up um, our residential routes uh, we will initially do uh, so, you know one pass each direction 
that will give folks the ability to travel. Cul-de-sacs, the throat's going to be one pass each direction and then around the bubble. This is going to end up leaving a strip of snow of varying width along the curb line. It may be on both sides of the street, it may be only on one side of the street. Um, we are going to, uh, we will then go back after the snow event's over and clean those, clean those areas up. The, you know, pluses and minuses of all of, all of these, um, if doing these different things is, uh, this one we hope will get folks moving faster. It may result in them having to shovel their driveways more than once because we, when we come back through that second time, there will be an unavoidable wind roll in those, in those driveways. Um, so that's that's what we're doing to hopefully mob get folks moving a little bit a little bit faster. One of the one of the challenges that we are going to have the rest of the season, is, and we just found out about this Friday, we um, we normally start with our season with we have a salt dome. We start our season with 900 tons of salt. We'll either, depending on on budget, we will either at the end of the season replenish to that point or buy very early in the following fiscal fiscal year so and then as we as the year goes along as we use snow or you saw typically on a snow event a snow event will use 100 150 tons we order that and replenish so at all times we have um, 900 tons in the in the dome uh, currently we have somewhere about between three and four hundred tons in the dome we have 586 tons outstanding in orders from our con contract supplier. Uh, when we pushed them on this, they basically told us they didn't know when they were going to be able to fulfill those orders. We did a little bit of research and found that nationwide there is a salt shortage very similar to what there was in 2009. There is no more salt available. We have managed to uh, purchase 200 tons from another vendor, and we also today uh, purchased 200 tons of 200 tons of sand. We had questions that come up earlier. Why don't we use sand? Um, one, we didn't. We typically we don't because we're not set up that way. We don't have a place to really store it indoors. And once it gets outdoors with moisture in it, it freezes, it clumps, and uh, clogs up our, our equipment. We have not had a good experience with that. Um, today, we we got some some winter ice salt that is supposed to have some chemical treatment in it to prevent the clumping. And so this next event, we will be using a um, like a 30% salt, 70% sand mixture on, on the streets. We will probably be using that the rest of the year to to stretch our, our salt budget. So there's going to be a few a few differences there. Um, the there is going to be a sand when it's done. There's going to be a sand residue on the street. There may be a sand residue up in up in yards. When I was in Minnesota, they used it quite a bit. And every spring, it was a tradition. You swept the first three feet of about a half an inch of sand out of your yard into the into the curb line, and then the street sweeper came by and, and picked it up. Hopefully, we won't be leaving those kind of. Yes, sir. What does the sand do to um, our our drainage systems? Hopefully, we won't be using that much. That we'll be able to that we'll be able to get it out of the curb line before it gets into into the storm sewer system. So what, what it will help with a little bit is if we get the snowpack on the roads, it should help provide some abrasion so that folks get, folks get better, better traction. But, so we will, be use, we will still use salt on, on slick spots and other, other trouble areas, but very, very judiciously. Questions for, uh, go ahead. This, this is more to my fellow councilman. Last year I had the opportunity to ride with uh, the, a couple of the, the plow drivers and, and it was very eye-opening. Um, so if it's possible, uh, since we have some advance notice, I, I would highly recommend somebody having that same experience because it, it gives you a new appreciation for the snow removal process. Other comments, questions? I'll just add a couple of comments. Um, I've been fielding, as, as uh, Councilmember Pifo had noticed, noted, uh, we've all been fielding a number of calls and emails and stuff like that. Um, uh, and each one of them, I appreciate the information that uh, you and the city manager have been sending out. It keeps us updated so I can give people uh, good status of what's going on. Um, 
sometimes like last year I think we got a couple of recommendations that uh, we took a look at and uh, which is good so you know we don't uh, ignore suggestions that come in um, and I also will add that uh, I was listening to the chatter on the scanner between uh, in fact I you know include chief on this one uh, the the public works crew and and the police department uh, uh, throughout gosh beginning Friday night going throughout all day Saturday and Sunday uh, I was I was getting the biggest kick out of the banter between everybody everybody was entirely professional I know it had to be frustrating at times especially with cars sliding off the road and uh, people unappreciative of the uh, the work that the uh, public's work crew was doing so kudos to the public works group and to the police group uh, consummate professionals out there appreciate it any more questions oh councilmember Hubach I would like to remind the people that uh, in Raymore we have more streets than other cities of the same size we do that we had a survey done uh, of I think about 10 years ago, and it listed the different uh, streets, uh, how many streets each uh, city was responsible for, and Raymore was up about like second or third in, in the Kansas City metropolitan area, leave, leaving out Kansas City, of course. So we hope that people will be remember that and be supportive when it, it's a little bit late in getting it into their street, because we do have so many streets to take care of. Yeah, if I remember right, and, and this is on our website, 350 lane miles? of uh, streets in Raymore and that's a that's a lot of streets and cul-de-sacs and dead ends and you know, all, all the challenges you could want in a snow event so other comments or questions thank you and we'll move on to the next item then the uh, city goals and objective uh, Eric thank you sir uh, as you you all I'm sure remember we we did uh, last July have a uh, a goal setting session on on a Friday and Saturday in July uh, where the uh, count, City Council and the management team met with consultant Hal Wood of Advisory Management Services uh, to develop goals and objectives for the city for to, to guide the city over the next uh, few years um, and that that session resulted in the generation of, of goals and 117 potential objectives uh, and which did seem a bit unwieldy to try to develop action steps for all 117 of those. So in a work session on September 30th of last year, it was agreed that we would focus on the ones that were uh, above the mean in terms of support according to the scoring system that Mr. Wood had, had uh, devised and we had used in that uh, session. Uh, and so uh, since then we have been, so, so we're, we're now at, uh, when you look at the number of objectives that are above the mean, that, that, that split it down a little bit more than half. So we now have 48 different objectives to go with the different goal areas uh, that uh, council indicated they would like the uh, staff to develop uh, proposed action steps for to accomplish each of those objectives. Uh, so we have been working on that, and uh, our, the result of our, our work is before you. Uh, we have developed uh, proposed action steps to accomplish each of these different objectives, and uh, we, we, they're before you tonight for your, uh, your, your input. Uh, and uh, at whenever the council feels like it's ready and that you've got the, the list of uh, goals, objectives, and action steps that you do want us to work on over the next few years, then I would intend to bring it to you for formal approval by a resolution just to make it official and then we would work on accomplishing each of these uh, and report to you quarterly as, as we did with the uh, last set of, of goals and objectives and action steps so uh, and I have asked those members of the management team who have some kind of an action step listed uh, these are all provided by the, the various people here uh, and if you have any specific questions or concerns about any of those then uh, hopefully we can we can address those with you so these are before you for your consideration. Comments from the council. Oh, Councilmember Pifo. Oh, just a, a quick question on educational opportunity. Uh, our first objective there is recruit college and community education. Is there a reason why we single out? Uh, I understand we have a relationship with the University of Central Missouri. But if we want to recruit college and community education, are we 
open to other partnerships? Are we looking at other partnerships? Or? Can I just ask, would you mind identifying that, that by, by number, number and letter, just so we know exactly which one you're talking about, sir? Uh, let's see. It would be C, big C, educational C1. opportunity. C1. Yeah, C1. All right, C1. Uh, and uh, Gene, uh, would you like to address the question of, uh, uh, <coughs> You know, working with others aside from the University of Central Missouri, I, I would just know that we have an existing relationship with the University of Central Missouri. But uh, Gene, would you like to uh, talk about that one? Well, we thought since we had a working, ongoing working relationship with the University of Central Missouri, that that would be the place to start. We haven't ruled anybody out. Uh, we just thought we had a starting place there to go from. I'll add that uh, the uh, Metropolitan Community College uh, group, uh, specifically Longview, uh, has done a, um, a survey in, in North Cass County here. Um, they're looking to expand what they have been doing in uh, Belton, and they were looking, you know, uh, you know, is there is there something in, uh, from Raymore residents or North Cass residents uh, that they could support? That survey went out a while back. I think it's been returned, and they're they're doing the number crunching on it now. As soon as uh, as soon as I see anything, I can provide it to the council. Um, I'd also point out, since this was one of the topics I raised during our session on the community education concept, um, there was also some non-college education discussion. For example, uh, our current parks department does some. Uh, activities uh, that you'll see in the review sometimes for community you know groups to get together to do different projects and then the idea was to maybe uh, expand along the lines of like a community kind of concept and what I would say is if there's anything that you'd like to us to add tonight uh, or subtract for that matter if there's are any in there that you don't think are appropriate or any that would change but that would you know, if you have something specific that you'd like us to add, that would help us, and we can we can add that for uh, when, whenever we bring it back to you for formal consideration. Um, Mr. Burr. I, I think it may become a little more challenging. I think probably most of you saw that the University of Missouri just ended their relationship with Blue Springs, and part of this is, as you know, a budgetary affects uh, University of Central Missouri has gone through a crunch. Uh, we're seeing it over on the Kansas side with the University of Kansas and uh, the cutback in education programs on basically both sides of the line. So uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a, becoming a bigger challenge but a bigger opportunity at the same time. Council Member Hubach. I have a little bit of, of a problem with that since we have a very good school system and it takes in two cities, I don't know that it's up to us to really say what we want to do about the school, whether we want to do uh, ask for special favors or anything like that because they've got to consider Peculiar as well as they do Raymore. And it seems to me like that is something that the school district should be in charge of and, and not us. Am I wrong on that? Because, I, for instance, ensure a quality school district. That's not our affair. That's the school district's uh, problem. And they've got to take in the consideration of both Raymore and Peculiar at the time they're doing that. The only thing that I see that we can do to help the school would be to annex that area down there so the school can have uh, the police patrol at the, uh, for traffic. That's the only thing that we could possibly do. But as far as getting a university classes or, or doing community college, we can't really do that just for Raymore without uh, uh, Peculiar involved either, can we? I don't know. Councilmember uh, Moorhead and then Kellogg. I, I think what we, I, I remember the discussion on this. Uh, I think one of the things we're doing is, first of all, we're leaving it open for the department to look at what relationships they want to create with other entities like colleges and universities not necessarily that we would directly go and start offering a satellite campus 
in addition, I think when we were talking about adding that in there about supporting the school district, it wasn't designed that we would offer classes or be in competition, but to reach out to the school and to see what the dist whether there are things that we could do to supplement or assist, you know, even if it were, I know one of the mentions was either maybe offering uh, some compu a computer lab or some library resources or other things that, or classrooms, for example, if a, uh, if uh, the school district wanted to do something off campus. Um, so it's really not meant to compete against, it was just meant to complement. Uh, but it, we left it wide open as far as what the department would like to reach out to do. I don't think it was specifically related to creating a college uh, satellite. Councilmember Kellogg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Moorhead, for that, because that's what I was sort of going to say. Uh, I, I remember that in the context of the, the um, discussions we had back then, and it was taking place up at Foxwood Springs during our retreat. Um, it was what we could do, and, and I'm paraphrasing for the body, but this was a discussion. What we could do as the body to support and help facilitate that what we can do on this end that will help them on that end. Not that we were going to dictate or or come up with a a plan or an action or anything like that, but to for to direct staff to come back to us and see if there's something that we could do as far as our policies to help fac facilitate that on that end. And I'll add to that, you know, school districts operate within certain constraints and then a lot of times they just you know they have to deal within very defined uh, borders so whereas our body because we're not limited with those constraints we can help them think outside of those boxes and say okay you know what's either a different perspective of looking at it or you know uh, one of the things the district does is um, you know they let uh, students let their teachers further their education um, they have some arrangement with like William Woods that they do a class, you know, out at the school. Well, you know, we were just kind of looking at, you know, is a way to make those offerings, you know, more of a regular deal, but, you know, in, in one of our buildings or, you know, just as a way to further that working relationship. Well, I, I can understand where you all are coming from, Mr. Mayor, but they are a separate political entity in the same way that the fire department is, and I don't see us doing that for the fire department or for the county. So, you know, we could very easily be stepping on other people's toes because, like I said, they are a separate political entity, and they cover seven different cities as well as townships. So they cover more than what we do, and... I think we would be spinning our wheels to ask them to, to take a special look at Raymore on anything what Raymore might do for them mm -hmm. because of, of uh, the sheer numbers that they have to handle of other cities and, and townships. Yeah, I, the only thing that I would add is, uh, to that is, is that we're not advocating doing anything. Uh, we're advocating exploring. Uh, and, and the one, the, the example that I would use is H, culture, Three, promote and support public art. Uh, lowercase e, institute, institute a policy requiring private developments to earmark a certain percentage for public art. Now, the way that's phrased and everything, it sure sounds like the council's made its decision right now that we're going to require uh, uh, private developers to, uh, to spend their, their funds on public art. But that's not the case. This is, uh, we're, exploring this sort of thing is this something that that we want to implement in the in the city in the same vein as um, uh, if if uh, and I'm, I'm making this uh, making this up if uh, uh, central missouri uh, cmsu came out and said you know we really would like to offer this class uh, i i think there's enough draw here in uh, ray moore and belton peculiar uh, maybe some people come up from harrisonville ray moore what how could you support, uh, you know, can, can you help us? Uh, and at that point, after we've, uh, the city staff has looked into it, the answer might be, you know, we really can't. We don't have any place for you to have classes, but if you could talk to uh, the Raypex School District, they might have some room for you. It, it, more than having, um, my take on it is, 
more than having every one of these items is a concrete thing that's going to end up with the, the council passing some resolution or, or bill, uh, it's, it's some background. Remember, this is going to go on just like how long did the last set of uh, goals go on? It was a couple about, of years. About four years. About four years. So this is going to be right in four years, and we know that every year half the council can turn over, right? So this needs to be something that somebody coming in a year from now that's never seen it before can look, go, go through it, talk to the city manager and the other council members and say, what, what was the council thinking back then and, what, uh, and the, the progress reports that the, uh, the staff has sent out regularly is really useful to, to reminding us what each of these things was for. I remember not too long ago when we insisted that a developer had to put aside not only money for or in lieu of land for the park department, but they had to also make a donation to the school district. And Raymore was the only one that was requiring it. And that seemed to me to be excessive because we were all paying the same school tax, which was the highest that we pay of any of our taxes. And yet we were insisting that our developers also make a second contribution uh, to the uh, school district for, for whatever reason. And so with that in my mind, I'm thinking about it. And as far as goals are concerned, if we're just going to talk about them and don't plan to achieve anybody, why are we wasting our time? Well, it's, it's uh, the first thing is to understand. The second thing is to develop a, a, a process for addressing the need. Councilmember Moorhead. Hey, Ms. Schubach, I, I totally respect what you're saying. I think you're bringing up a very good point. But one of the things I guess I would give you some tangible examples to wrap your mind around is that we participate in conjunction with the school district every Monday night. I mean, how many times do we have high school students that come in and observe our meetings? That's an example of how we're assisting developing a quality school district. Um, our municipal court judge works ag aggressively with the youth court and has developed that. And that's, that's something that we as a city can offer as an outlet for the schools to learn outside of the classroom. So the, this is when I, I know when I spoke about this issue um, and made comment about it during the retreat, that was my mindset, was what relationships can we create where the school district is the school district. We are not in the business of running a school, but when in the, in the governance of our city, how can we work in conjunction and offer and assist to them? So those are just some examples that you might, I mean, I would offer to you to, to help understand that. Uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor, if oh. I might come in on that just a little bit. Well, I, and I, I didn't see you waving behind me. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, you didn't have that looking in your rear view mirror at the right time. Uh, and, and you raise a good question, Ms. Hubach, but one of the first things we would do as we start moving forward on, on setting up action on the goals would be to sit down and talk with the superintendent of schools and I meet at least once a month, or try and meet at least once a month to talk about economic development, uh, new businesses, new uh, revenue streams that might be coming in what, to the school district with, with new businesses being brought to the community. Uh, and one of the first things we would do would be discuss, is there an interest in bringing that type of uh, program to, to the area and could it possibly fit into the school system uh, use of their facilities or something like that? So there would be a lot of questions that we would pursue before we would even go to the next step. Well, Mr. Mayor, I have attended in the past, you know, we meet quarterly with the school district and the city of Peculiar to talk about items of mutual interest. And none of these things have ever come, to my knowledge, have ever come up on something like that. The school tells us the number of children that they have and they've got any new uh, programs going and we tell them what we're doing in the city of Raymore and Peculiar says what they're doing. But I, from what you all are talking about, I don't quite see that because we meet with them, like I say, uh, quarterly, and maybe we need to have more discussion with the school district on some of these issues than what we're having. Because when we meet, we talk about what we've done in the past, but we seldom talk about what we're going to plan for the future. You know, it, 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 and, and uh, Councilwoman uh, Del Guadel, I'll give you the floor in just a minute. It's, it almost feels like they were rehashing the two discussions that we've already had when, when these goals were set up. And, 
you know, it, I'm, when I read through these, I'm, there were some that I was uncomfortable with, simply because I didn't like the goal as it, as it was established by the, the council. Uh, I didn't like the goal. Well, I'm not going to pull it off there. They, the, the council wanted it on there. So, Council Member Abdel -Gwan. Thank you. I was just going to piggyback up off of what Mr. Moorhead said and kind of talking about how um, a big part of this also is having a quality school district helps improve the growth in Raymore. And so having a, that connection, having that teamwork with the school district will all in all help us as a city. Not that the city's going to tell the school district what to do or you know anything like that, just that we need to work together to continue to improve our city. And so having that good teamwork with the school district will be beneficial. And I think that as sometimes, you know, from citizens who think we're just a sounding board, and so they give us suggestions for the school district. So having an opportunity for us to pass along that information um, to someone who might talk to me but not call their school board member or something. So just an opportunity to have a connection to pass on information and work together with the school district, I think will do nothing but improve our city. So I think that's part of the basis of this also. Other comments? Councilwoman? Well, I remember not too long ago when we got into a very heated discussion, not only in the council, but in the community on uh, the school levy. And uh, we had people actively on the council actively working against it, the levy. And it seemed to me that was getting out of our realm of responsibility. It's not our place to discuss the school's levy pro or con at all. And I just don't want us to get in, to, so involved in it that we forget that we can do certain things that our parameters in some way are just as restricted as the schools. So and, and if I remember right, the council uh, took the position of no position on, on that levy uh, as, as an official action, if I remember right. Now, that said, in, any, any one of us is also a, a uh, member of the community. As long as you're not acting as a council person, remember the council only works uh, in, in, as a majority. So, other comments? I almost called you PFO again. Council Member Boehner. <laughs> I'm going to switch gears here for a second. Um, I'd like to uh, just kind of ask for a clarification on item uh, G, two point D. Um, determine the appropriateness of creating a design theme for the city, and I wanted to kind of better understand what that was. Uh, Jim, that's on page. It's on page 14, 14. and uh, that is uh, G. 2D, uh, determine the appropriateness of creating a design, quote unquote, theme for the city and its uh, GMP action step. Uh, Jim, can you address that a little bit more? That was a specific uh, goal that came out of the growth management plan effort. It was consensus of the group that was working on that particular item, not necessarily to establish a theme, but for the city, as some communities have a very specific design theme. Right. And there was some thought of exploring if that would benefit Raymore to try to build off of some commonality that we may have with design within the community. Nobody identified a, a specific theme or design type, but it was thought, let's, let's explore that, see if maybe we should be working towards that. Would that help the identity of Raymore? And it was sure. really a question of identity. What, what separates us from other communities. Okay. Other questions or comments? Uh, Councilmember Wisco? Yeah, more of a clarification. On, on page 15, on 4C, build on the history of Raymore as a horse-friendly community. I, I, don't, I don't remember that conversation. No, sir. I mean, again, these, we, are, we tried to come up with action steps to accomplish the objectives that had been identified. So the objective was provide a strong community identity and one of the uh, items that was thrown out, wasn't me but I assigned it to myself, uh, <laughs> was uh, build on the history of Raymore as a horse friendly community. So if that's not anything that interests you we can, we can take that up but that's 
that that action step was generated by staff in order to try to accomplish the objective. Yeah, well, that's why I just I I just don't remember having that conversation. It, it, that's no, why we did. It struck me just odd seeing yeah. it. Yeah, and 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 I I will add that when I saw that I smiled uh, mightily, uh, having been in, uh, peripherally involved in some of that activity back then. That was kind of neat. Uh, Council member, whatever your name is. <laughs> Um, the uh, I, I get I guess I would just say especially on previous comments of mine that I really feel like this has kind of started to harmonize pretty well I mean uh, I interpret this as something that we're gonna do for a long time we're gonna take some things off we're gonna add some things we're gonna dive into this we're gonna w new things will develop from it but I, I really have to say based on sitting on a Saturday morning with everybody versus what I'm seeing now I think things have started to come together pretty well and um, I, I, I think it reads well so yeah that, I, that's a really good point you know, I remember uh, the, the last set of uh, goals that we had and, and, and objectives and stuff where some of them uh, the city staff would dig into it and then report back to us and the council would go time out stop don't go that way you know uh, but again we we don't get moving unless we're We've got something to move with. So, Count, uh, was that a council member uh, Pifo? <laughs> number four. <laughs> um, I just had a quick question about one, and maybe it's just my mind trying to understand it. But under recreation, oh, just a second, page nine, recreation number four D. Accept dedication of land by developers rather than a fee in lieu of ded dedication. Is this basically saying that we're going to really push them to give us land instead of a fee? I didn't really understand what that was trying to, where that was going. Yeah, that, that, that uh, again, new number was just to make sure we're all. I'm on okay. recreation number 4D, 4D. on page yes. 9. That, that is the, um, the general idea of that was that uh, you know right now uh, developers do have they can, and it's up to the park board as to which is 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 agreed to but um, right now a developer can say I would like to dedicate land for parks or they can say I'd like to uh, donate money according to a formula which is outlined in the code uh, and then the park board has the option of which they do uh, what's being suggested here specifically is that we we make an effort to actually try to obtain land rather than money uh, from developers to develop more smaller parks throughout the city as opposed to uh, collecting money and then using it for larger areas. When I read that, I just thought that sounds like what we do. <laughs> uh, and, that, and some of these are things that we're, we're doing already and we're just sort of trying to uh, reemphasize that or reinforce that that is what the council wants to do. Council Member Westcote and then Hubar. Uh, my final question uh, on page 17 uh, 5 and B uh, explore creating a stage amphitheater or other performance area of some sort in Hawkridge Park um, now is that a suggestion that was made before we did the uh, the, the park master plan um, or was this something that we're going to do um, outside of it even though it wasn't recommended uh, within the plan itself I, I, at least I don't believe it was recommended inside the plan uh, and John, maybe you can, I honestly don't remember. I, if we were putting this together and it, before the plan was finally adopted. So uh, John, can you talk to the status of that particular item in lieu of uh, the final uh, Hawkridge Park Master Plan? Uh, yes, that item was identified in the Hawkridge Master Plan as one of the considerations uh, of small performance type stage that would, that would be located along the lakefront. Uh, now, whether or not the park board falls through that on their action steps as far as the park development, obviously that would be up to them. Uh, but currently, there's, there is no funding or specific plan to develop a stage in Hawk Ridge Park. Councilmember Hubach, you had your hand up. My, <coughs> excuse me. My understanding was on 
the, in planning and zoning or even in the park, the first choice is you want to get the land so that you can have a neighborhood park. That's the first thing. But in some cases, you don't want a neighborhood park there because it's right next to maybe a regional or a larger one, so you're willing to take the money then in, in, lieu, of, in lieu of the land. But the land usually is supposed to come first, and then that's, that's how they figure it out. We'll pause for a musical interlude. <laughs> Other comments, questions? Uh, Councilmember uh, Abdelgawad? I was just going to say that I remember, um, at least I think I remember that Saturday when we met talking about maybe Hawk Ridge Park being a great place to have some kind of stage. We talked about having an outdoor performance area. We, and I remembered talking about at the Farmer's Market Park or maybe Hawk Ridge Park or trying to find a place for that. So I'm glad that kind of exploring several options there. So, so let me ask you this. If, if it's something that the council really wants to see happen and it, it, it doesn't necessarily come out of a, a, a master plan that this is something that we really want to see happen, can the council still make that happen? Oh, yes, sir. I mean, and, and again, I mean, uh, as Mr. Moore had said, I mean, I, I see this, you know, there, there may be, as we report to you, you, you may discuss one of these and say, you know, we're just, we're not, we don't want to accomplish that action step. Or, on the other hand, you may say, you know, here's another one under that general objective that we'd like to add. So certainly, yeah. Well, I'd also point out in the Hawk Ridge Park Master Plan, there was a discussion on the west side of the park. There was some open acreage that was open and flexible for different projects or development and then actually at the last park board meeting the park board itself said when they kind of ratified the park board plan it this is open for discussion that it were they're not locked in and if a good idea came before them that it, you know different things can be done so nothing's set in well, pure stone yet so. council member Hubach. I wanted to go on page two at the top of it, it would be uh, five, improve affordability of housing. Every time that comes up before the council, we turn it down. So I'm just trying to figure out what it is that we have in mind and what, is, what do we plan to do to improve the affordability of um, housing. On page, you know, uh, would, uh, uh, page two, uh, number five, uh, E, page, is something that, uh, you know, if, if there is anything that uh, the city is doing to uh, create barriers that prevent the construction of uh, housing that's forward built, you know, it says eliminate any barriers. Now, I, I, I take that as not changing our codes to make uh, um, unsafe housing. But uh, if there's something that we're doing that makes it uh, difficult to build affordable housing, creating a barrier. So in answer to your question, that's, that's, that's my read of it. Well, is there something that we need to do, Mr. Mayor, to we talk about goals in the future well, with spring coming and, and housing being built? Uh, what can we do to improve the affordability of housing? What is our plan, our, our goal for this year on housing? Well, yeah. uh, please. Well, just as, as a general thing, I would say that's that's what the six action steps that are listed under number five are intended to do. That is that is the the plan that we're proposing for council consideration to accomplish that objective. Other questions, comments? Did you? No. Okay. I'll turn around. <laughs> Make sure that there's nobody back there doing that. Normally, it's uh, Councilmember Abdelgawad that I miss. <laughs> Other comments? Uh, then we'll go ahead and move forward and uh, bring this up to Council uh, for formal approval. Um, and again, this is something that goes on for a number of years and it gets massaged as, as things learn. So the second is, uh, item tonight is uh, guidelines for, for elected officials on appearing on city videos. Thanks. This is this is another one of yours. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. I, I want to thank members of the management team for coming tonight. By the way, to uh, just hear what the council's uh, uh, thoughts on the uh, goals and objectives. Uh, well, we we have, as you know, uh, 
begun producing video news updates. We've done a, a couple now. And, uh, and uh, I've, I've been the person uh, uh, on camera for, for those two that we've done. But uh, we, we have had uh, interest expressed by uh, members of the council uh, in also appearing on camera to provide public service announcements and, and uh, you know, various items of public interest. Uh, that does, uh, having elected officials appear on, on city media does sort of bring up some issues, certain challenges, uh, including the expressing of opinions, uh, which may not be those of the entire uh, governing body, uh, and also uh, perhaps uh, having an unfair advantage in a municipal election, depending upon the time of year, if a, a council member is, uh, has uh, indicated he, he's, he or she is uh, running for re-election, uh, they may, that may give them an advantage over their challenger. So uh, we tried to prepare just some really basic uh, guidelines, tried to keep it simple uh, for appearances by elected officials who might uh, appear on camera for, for various city uh, for video presentations, and I've uh, presented those to you uh, here. And uh, again, uh, these are open for your questions and, uh, and your thoughts and any changes that you might suggest. Uh, eventually, I'd like to also bring this to you for formal approval. Councilmember Moorhead. Mr. Berlin, on number six, uh, I would make the recommendation on line three that it be between the date, the opening date of filing, uh, not because I interpreted that as the date that a candidate would file. Technically, they could go on TV, wait to the last day of filing. I just think that the moment it is available for anybody to file, they should be exempt from that. I'll add that, sir. Councilmember Abdelgawan. Um, yeah, thank you. I got an email from um, Brian Harris from the Park Board, and he wondered how the council felt about changing it so that any appointed person could do could be on a video. So, like, for example, was it two years ago or just last year, the Park Board did a video as their yearly report. Yeah, and we played that on there. So would we need to change it so that appointed officials as well as elected officials um, could make a video as long as the script is approved and all of that. And another recommendation recommendation he had was um, to maybe do some highlights from some of the rec events or some of the sports that maybe that might be fun for people to watch on there, which is a separate issue than this. But Well, with, to, to address the second one first, absolutely we intend to do that. Uh, in, in, in fact, we're for the next one, I think we probably will show some footage. So that, yeah, recreation programming is something that people enjoy seeing, and and uh, we, we intend to do that certainly. Uh, and and with regard to having uh, park board members or others, uh, just looking at what I've got here, I wouldn't see if it's a council's wish. Uh, I don't see any issue with uh, adding, uh, you know, park board or or even planning and zoning or other appointed officials and and having them uh, susceptible to the same same general guidelines. Councilmember Hubach. I saw this as a First Amendment issue, and I had trouble with it all the way through because I'm not in favor of censoring speech in the city of Raymore at all. And we on the council speak uh, every Monday night, we're speaking on something. And so it's not a question that people don't hear us. They hear us on this. And I, by accident, tuned in to uh, something called YouTube and heard us again on um, the council meeting. So I don't know how many times we're on different channels and on the internet and everything else when they're hearing about our, our meetings. So it's not like people don't know what's going on. What I saw on this was where it said, one of the places in there where they was going to let the um, city manager determine if the speech, uh, speech was all right. Absolutely not. The council is supposed to speak with one voice, and usually when the council speaks, the, uh, uh, the news people, they talk to the mayor as the representative of the council. And I had trouble with uh, the rest of this. I don't know what the rest of you want to do, but I don't feel a de burning desire to go on and explain my inner thoughts to everybody that wants to hear them. Well, and that's uh, precisely what this document is to uh, make sure that no one member of the council gets on the government TV channel 
and expresses their deepest, most inner thoughts, uh, not representing the council as a whole. That's that's what this thing is in place to avoid. Uh, council Member Westcott. You know, I initially had brought this up, um, you know, because I had seen uh, various uh, state reps and state senators, they had done it on Comcast on cable, where they would just do like a, it, almost like a little commercial, you know, like you know, anytime it was time to vote. So they, they, they talked about the importance of registering to vote and how your vote, you know, really impacts on a local level as opposed to a national level. So it wasn't that I'm expressing my opinion, it was just there was a, a certain topic and it was just a way to, you know, to speak with constituents, um, which is how I kind of see it going. It, it's not that uh, the city manager is going to censor anybody's speech. Uh, they just want to make sure that it's on topic. And, you know, if we're supposed to be talking about registering to vote, that we don't start talking about, you know, sidewalks and streets and things like that. We need to stay on topic, which is what I think that role of the city manager is on, in that particular um, uh, regulation. Yes, please. Believe me, I don't relish being in the role of arbiter, uh, but I don't know who else could do it. And, it, and it, I do think that the, if, if any council member or anybody else these days wants to do an advocacy piece, boy, it's pretty darn easy. You can, you know, use your your uh, smartphone and upload something to YouTube and, and, you know, express personal opinions all you like. It, it's a question of using the city's media to express uh, opinions. And, and it seemed from our previous discussion, because we did have a previous discussion about it, that uh, it was the council's desire to make sure that everything that's presented is, is objective. In fact, there, that reminds me of a question I was going to ask. There is a, a limitation uh, with the agreement that we have with the cable provider that this station be used only for s city activities, or can anybody be? Uh, can uh, I, I'm, you know, some book club get on there and say, hey, the book this week we're reading is such and such? No, that that's right. Well, we the city has gui created guidelines for its television way back in the 1990s, okay. and, and they do generally follow the rule that it will be only city things, and it is not a public access channel, in right, other words, right. where, okay, where people go. can develop their own programming and it will be broadcast. Okay. Council Member Moran. Uh, Ms. Hubach, on a constitutional standpoint, I would point out uh, the speech and debate clause only applies on the floor during the public forum. So even at the federal level, they can be sanctioned for things they say even out in the hallways. So I would point that out. Also, they are regulated by the Federal Trade Commission, Federal Election Commission, regarding what they can and do and say on television. Um, even during non-election periods, so it's not it's not an absolute right. The city does have the ability to set parameters, and this is well within the boundaries of uh, that protected speech issue from a constitutional standpoint. How do you determine what's non-editorial? Uh, that is a pretty difficult thing to do. Well, first of all, it's my understanding that the city will review it to determine that. That's where the scrutiny comes from. Yeah, we don't, as the speaker, get to determine that. And Mr. Berlin, would you agree or not agree? Yes, sir. I, you know, it would be on a case-by-case -case basis, though. Each, each, you know, I think, as I say, it's not a role I really relish uh, undertaking, and I, I'd, I'd hate to have to tell one of my bosses that, no, I'm sorry, you can't say that. But uh, I, I, I don't know, you know, amongst you, who would other member would be able to, to uh, be in that role. So I would just you know, hope that council members would look carefully at the guidelines, and, and if I felt that somebody had crossed the line into advocacy, I would uh, try to gently point that out and come to uh, uh, an agreement as to what, uh, how we might present that. Moorhead followed by uh, Wesco. And I guess, actually, don't we do have the ability to control it, because if we feel a council member is getting out of line, we can always come before, uh, up to the council, and we can revoke this. We don't we have the authority to pull this back if, if we feel somebody's abusing or, or do you mean to uh, eliminate the idea of having elected officials on camera yes for sure that's that would be entirely up to you and, and of course we could always have the uh, non-voting mayor uh, review to make sure everything is <laughs> you know it, <laughs> that would probably not be a good idea because the mayor is an elected of official also you know, so this, this is true, this is true. Other comments? Okay, did, did you have something, Kevin? I did, uh, of an idea. Um, 
I, I appreciate Mr. Berlin's uh, concern on this. And I also respect Mrs. Hubach's opinions and, and I understand her concerns. Um, in the case, you know, and not trying to relieve Eric of, of, of the duty of that, somebody needs to do it, um, but I, I, I do, I, I, I don't envy you. <laughs> uh, and I hate to see it be pushed off onto the mayor, but in the case that some somebody tries to just really go off onto the left wing uh, radical stuff and uh, before it's aired couldn't we just call for a special meeting of the body to evaluate what Eric is is trying to do and that way you know yeah I, I would think that um, if, if a member of the council wanted to do something uh, um, and proposed a script to uh, the city manager and the city manager looked at it and said you know this is does not fit what the council is is agreed to uh, that member of the council uh, could ask uh, that 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 be reviewed by the the uh, rest of the council. Um, and now, having said that, I, I I would really want to see that you know if, if somebody uh, came forward with something that was turned down, I'd, I'd really like to see a super majority of the council agree to it. I mean, it, it you know it's, it's not just. Uh, and you know, I I, you know, I didn't think of it that far, but I do like the super majority aspect of that I do uh, did you have your hand up okay so it sounds like maybe we need to add kind of an appeal process I, I will I will add yes something like that uh, for your consideration when I bring it back for formal consideration but uh, with a provision for appeal with uh, an override of the city manager's decision by a super majority that yeah, sounds good thank All you right. I was just going to say the lawyer in me was screaming to say that uh, we're always governed by the four corners of the document, and if it's not in there, we're in trouble. So I thought that was a wonderful suggestion. Unfortunately, it makes this go even longer, but it is an important step that needs to be in. Councilmember Hubach, your yes, number um, uh, what does it be? Provide educational information that helps support the mission of the city or an adopted city goal. Suppose that there is a, um, is a four to um, and a five to three vote on something. On this, you wouldn't let the three that were opposed to it speak up because they would not be promoting, the, uh, approving what was being done. So it would curtail the ability of the, the majority then to speak out. There's where I come down as far as the problem. Yes, but, but the whole idea behind this is that any council member going before the uh, the uh, the TV there would be stating something that the council had already put into effect. Uh, no, no council member is going to go uh, using your example of a five-three vote. The council will determine by uh, a majority of five to do something. Well. The three that were in the minority do not get the good in, on the uh, uh, government channel and espouse their position um, because the majority had already decided to go with the other position. But just because the majority decided does not always make it right. It does not always. Sometimes the minority is right, but that uh, it takes a while for the majority to realize that the minority is correct. Well, uh, that, now, may, that may be the case, but the way that this uh, system works is the majority rules uh, on the council. The council votes for something, and the majority uh, uh, rules. Councilmember of Delgawan. And it's not going to keep you from speaking up about it. You're still welcome to speak up about it, post your video on YouTube or your Facebook page or wherever else you want to, if that's what you choose to do. We're just saying that if it doesn't follow what the council supports, what the city supports, it's not going to be on the city's TV channel, which I think is legitimate and fair. Are, are you going to say something else? or Because I'm, I'm getting a, a general feeling that with that, that <laughs> two changes, one uh, setting at uh, the beginning is uh, opening a filing, and then the second change uh, uh, is a method of overriding the, the uh, 
the city manager. And, and another change would be adding board members uh, oh, to the yes. policy. Thank you, thank you. I um, would just think that if the city manager was wise, he would have absolutely nothing to do with something like this. Because this, this is, is wrong to have an employee decide what it is that the bosses are going to be able to say that's wrong. Well, I, I, I'm going to have to respectfully disagree. It's the council that's deciding what it is that they're allowing the council members to say, and it's mediated by the city manager and can be overruled by a major super majority of the council. Council Member Westcott. You know, and uh, again, originally when I when I came up with this concept, it was more to do public service announcements. You know, hey, it's springtime. If you're going to be out with your pets, make sure you clean up after them. You know, things along those that nature. It wasn't to get on and and and. Uh, you know, expound on your position on, you know, whether or not we should, you know, allow sidewalks to, to cross a street or, or, you know, whatever it is, you know, because w if, if I'm going to vote a certain way, I don't need to get on TV and tell everybody how I'm going to vote because I don't need the people to vote because I'm going to be the one who's voting for it. You know, now if, if we're getting ready to do a bond levy or something, then you know, yes, you need the voters to do that. So that, I could see how, you know, if you were for it or against it, how you could get on and manipulate the populace. But if it's something about, you know, an ordinance, you know, I, the, the city doesn't vote on an ordinance. You know, I vote on the ordinance. And if I'm going to persuade anybody else, I don't need to go on TV to persuade my seven fellow council members. I do that up on the dais. So there's no advantage for me to get up on TV and to, you know, try to solicit, you know, that type of, of, of a response or feedback because, you know, it's eight votes. It's not the populace that's voting. So there's no manipulation there. Um, okay. So. But suppose you've got something that the populace is going to vote on. For instance, we're going to have on uh, three charter amendments. And by state statute, we can only speak educationally. We cannot come out in support of it or opposed to it. We can only say, this is what it will do, and we have to give both sides of it. Now, that's the kind of thing that I uh, guess we're talking about. How you, are you well, going you, to- Well, you wouldn't allow that then, uh, council member, to get on and advocate one way or the other. Uh, the, the council members would get up and do a PSA about uh, uh, making sure your hoses are disconnected from the outside faucets because it's going to be cold tonight. And that's about the extent of the, the depth that is going to be uh, uh, on the council members. Now, I don't know how many of you are going to be wanting to get on TV. I'm not one of them. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, and Ms. Kubach, I would remind you that Mr. Berlin is governed by the parameters under Section 1 where that, that's helped to help scrutinize what we can and can't say. I'd point out that it seems pretty clear to me when we're, not, we're to provide non-editorial information that, that pretty, that's pretty expressly stating that we will not be advocating a position one way or the other on things. That's not the kind of information that we will be allowed to present. You know, and I, and I take it back. There, there is one case, and, 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 and you made me think of it, there is one case that I might get on um, um, uh, and to do a PSA for our animal control uh, uh, adoption facilities for, for people that need another pet. <laughs> you know, it's safer, I don't even comment. Go ahead. Uh, one other suggestion uh, dealing with uh, uh, appointed board members is maybe limiting what they can speak about to the board that they were that they're served on you know if, if it's you know somebody from parks board wants to speak that it's they must stay within their defined topic and I see a bunch of heads going yeah that's a good addition so other comments okay this will come before us with the, the changes noted so is there any other things that need to be discussed today yes please go ahead and it's going to be about an animal I know no, I, oh. <laughs> no, well, it does actually slightly touch on animal control. I just want to say I am glad to see a familiar face back in the room. The <laughs> Chief Zimmerman is joining us again. We're glad to see you. Glad you're coming. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you uh, for coming out, and uh, let's hope that it's just a dusting in the next couple of days. But, Mike, keep it up. 
We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>